So in this experiment, we're going to look at the effect of pH and osmotic pressure on microbial growth. And this is activity 2-10 and 2-11. So what we would have you do is these would already be set up for you in the back of the classroom and you would look at the different bacteria and you would quantitate how much the bacteria grew under different pH conditions. And so there are three bacteria that we're going to look at. We have Lactobacillus acidophilus, we have Staphylococcus aureus, and we have Alcaligenes faecalis. And so let's look at our results for each of these organisms. So the first one is going to be lactobacillus. So what you're looking at is we have multiple tubes here. This one was inoculated with lactobacillus at a pH of two, pH of four, pH six, pH eight, and pH 10. And for comparison, we have an uninoculated control. And so what we're looking at is we wanna quantitate how much the bacteria grew under each condition. So to do this, we use turbidity as a measurement of how much the bacteria grew. Now, to make it easier to quantitate the amount of turbidity, we take a pipette and we stick it behind the tubes, and then we look at the clarity to read those numbers. So for example, in the uninoculated control, you can see this six very clearly. Comparatively, if you compare pH 10 and pH 8, they look about the same as the uninoculated control. So we would say that for these, that bacteria did not grow under pH 8 and pH 10. However, if we look at pH 6, we can start to see a little bit of turbidity. Notice that the number is not quite as clear, so we're gonna quantitate that with plus one. So there's just a little bit of growth. Notice at pH 4, it's starting to get even more turbid the cloudiness is getting greater. So let's say we give this two plus, whereas if we look at pH two, notice that the one is very much obscured, it's very difficult to see, and so we quantitate this as being three plus. So if we look at this experiment, what we can see is that for lactobacillus, it grew best at a pH of two, followed by a pH of four, followed by a pH of six, and then not at all at the alkaline pH. So because this bacteria grew better at the acidic pH, we would call this organism an acidophile. It's an acidophile and it grows best at low pHs. And so in this case, it grew best at a pH of two and it grew all the way up to about pH six. After that, the bacteria can't grow outside of that range. And so this would be an example of an acidophile. Lactobacillus acidophilus is a bacteria used to make yogurt. And so it grows best under these acidic pH. If we look at Staph aureus, so again, here is our uninoculated control. Notice that a pH of 10 did not grow. pH of two did not grow. If we were to look at pH six, notice that you can almost not see the number altogether. So I quantitated this as being four plus. The pH eight and the pH four, they look approximately the same. And so I quantitated those as being a two plus. Now notice that this test, the way that we're quantitating this is very subjective. What I might call two plus, you might call one plus, or you might call three plus. It's very much subjective, but the idea is still the same. When we look at Staph aureus, it grew best at a pH of six, but it ranged from four to eight. So notice that for Staph aureus, it grew best around a neutral pH. We would call this type of bacteria a neutrophile. It grows best at a neutral pH. That makes sense. Most bacteria are neutrophiles. Most bacteria grow best at a neutral pH, which is what we see because remember that in our experiments where we use a pH indicator, almost every time the pH starts out at a neutral pH. So fennel red starts out orange. Bromocrestal purple starts out that orange. Uh, OF test starts out green because most bacteria are neutrophiles and they grow best at the neutral pH. So we inoculate the broth starting at a neutral pH and then look for pH changes depending on the type of reaction we are looking for.
And so Staph aureus would be an example of a neutrophile. If we look at Alcaligenes faecalis, this is an organism found in the colon, and it is, faecalis tells you feces. Remember that Alcaligenes faecalis is non-sacrolytic. So again, it's found in the colon. And if we look at where it grew best, it grew best at about a pH of eight. So three plus would be a pH of eight. pH 10 grew a little bit less. So we call that two plus. pH six, we do see a little bit of growth. So I might quantitate that as being one plus. But at pH two and pH four, there is no growth. The turbidity is not there and it looks like the uninoculated control. And so if we look at the alkaligenes, it grew at a range of about pH 6 to pH 10, and optimally between 8 and, nine, 8 and 10. So as a result, this bacteria grows better at the alkaline or the basic pH, and so we call this organism an alkalophile. It grows best at the high pH. That makes sense because for alkaligenes, its home is in the intestine and the pH is approximately a pH of eight. It's very different than the pH of the stomach, which is a pH of two. But alkaligenes faecalis is found in the colon and therefore grows best at about a pH of eight. And so this is just to show you that different bacteria have different optimal pH that they grow at. Some grow best at an acidic pH, some grow best at a neutral pH, some grow best at an alkaline pH. It just varies from bacteria to bacteria. And so you would want to be able, if you were shown these tubes, you would want to be able to look at them and based on which tubes grew, you would then tell me if that bacteria is an alkalophile, a neutrophile, or an acidophile based on the range of pH at which they grew. So the next experiment is looking at the effect of osmotic pressure on microbial growth. And so again, this would be an experiment that would be set up in the back of the classroom and you guys would just go look at it and quantitate the amount of growth. And what you're gonna see in the next slide is that we have two types of bacteria. We have Staphylococcus aureus, and what you'll see is when we grew them under different salt concentrations, Staph aureus grew at all concentrations of salt that we tested, from 2% salt all the way up to 11% salt. Now, if you think about it, remember that salt concentrations are going to affect the way that water moves, right? And so if salt concentrations are too high, Oftentimes, that's going to create a hypertonic environment outside the cell, and the water is going to leave the cell, and it's going to do plasmolysis. It's going to shrivel up. Certain bacteria have adaptations that allow them to live to a greater range of salt concentrations, and we call those organisms osmotolerant. They're osmotolerant. They're able to tolerate changes in osmotic pressure meaning they can grow under different salt conditions. This makes sense that Staph aureus would be osmotolerant because Staph aureus is found on the skin. And if you think about like your skin and when you sweat, if you're like working out really hard and you're sweating and that sweat gets into your mouth, what does it taste like? Well, it tastes very salty. So it makes sense that bacteria that are found on the skin are often going to be osmotolerant because they have to tolerate that high salt concentration. Escherichia coli or E. coli can only grow at certain salt conditions. It grew at 2% salt and a little bit at 5%, but you're gonna see that it did not grow at all at eight or 11%. So E. coli is not osmotolerant. It lives in the gut and it can't tolerate changes in salt. It has to have a very narrow range of salt concentrations in order for E. coli to grow. And so let's look at these results. So here is our experiment for Staph aureus. So again, we have our uninoculated control. So this is our bacteria that, uh, or this is our tube that has no bacteria. Notice we can see the number very clearly. If we look at Staph aureus, notice that it grew best at a 2% salt. So we'll quantitate that with four pluses. 
grew a little bit less at a percentage of salt for 5%. So maybe we give that 3 plus, 8% salt, it grew a little bit less, 2 plus. And even at 11% salt, notice that it is still have, it does still have some turbidity relative to the uninoculated control. So this we're gonna give a one plus. So for Staph aureus, it grew at all of the different salt concentrations that were tested from 2% up to higher than five times that amount at 11% and it still was able to grow. And so again, we would call Staph aureus osmotolerant. It's able to grow at a range of salt concentrations, not just one, but it's able to tolerate salt concentrations that vary. And so that's why we call these organisms osmotolerant. And so that would be for Staph aureus, which again makes sense because Staph aureus is found on the skin. The skin is salty. Bacteria have to be able to tolerate salt concentrations. On the other hand, if we look at E. coli, again, here is our uninoculated control. Notice that for pH 11, or sorry, for 11% salt, no growth. 8% salt, no growth. So these are both negative. 5% salt, very little growth, very little. I would quantitate this as one plus. But at 2% salt, notice it grew very, very well. And so I gave that four plus. So for E. coli, it grew at 2% salt, a tiny bit at 5%, but not at 8 or 11, which tells us that this bacteria is not osmotolerant. It is not able to tolerate changes in osmotic pressure. It's not able to tolerate high salt. And so there are some organisms that tolerate or even require high salt concentrations and for those organisms, like a type of archaea called halobacterium, it can survive on salt crystals, and the salt concentration can be upwards of 30% salt. Very, very high salinity, very high salt concentrations, but they have adaptations that allow them to survive at that high salt. And so you can see this sometimes if you were to go up to a place called Mono Lake. Mono Lake has a very... Um, salty environment, and if archaea is uh, halobac halobacterium, which is an archaea, if it's growing there, the water will sometimes appear pink because of the pink hue of that particular archaea, and it's able to tolerate that high salt. And so not only does it grow at potentially lower osmotic pressures, but it grows at high osmotic pressures. And again, there are some organisms that require high salt, meaning they don't just tolerate high salt, they actually require it. That's an obligate halophile. It requires high salt. But in this case, when we looked at Staph aureus, that was osmotolerant. It tolerated a variety of different salt. It doesn't require high salt, but it can tolerate it. And so this is our experiment on looking at the effect of osmotic pressure on microbial growth. And so the point of these two activities is just to show you that bacteria have different environments in which they can grow. They have an optimal environment and then they have a range of environments that they can tolerate. And so this would be our experiment looking at the effect of pH and osmotic pressure on microbial growth.